Hello, and welcome to episode 16 of Starside Chat, the official podcast of the YouTube channel Starside Cafe. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Aaron, and with me is Zach. Zach, how's it going? Hello, it has been a while. It's been a little bit of time. I moved, and we've just been, other things have been happening in our lives, respectively. But I think both of us have gotten a little more stable, and so regular updates will begin to trickle trickle out uh, once again. Yeah, it's been kind of a busy summer for both of us. Maybe you more so than me, but uh, (laughs) it's been a little bit busy for both of us, and our schedules haven't necessarily synced up. So, yeah, but... I'm looking forward to playing more stuff, especially since uh, the fall is yes. coming very quickly, and there's going to be a ton of stuff to talk about going forward. So so much stuff, but yeah, I am now settled in my new home, and we're basically you're going back to school, and I'm going back to school at the same time. So we're, we're college be, kids again. We're college kids back in the old days, just like that. Uh, so <laughs> that will actually help us to stay on schedule. So anyway. Should we get to the news of the week? Let's get started. I had not heard about this. This apparently happened a little while ago, but there's a new Pokemon movie happening? Yeah, so it's called Pokemon the Movie, The Power of Us, and this was announced... It's been a while. It was like July 30th or something like that. It was... So, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since this announcement, but we haven't recorded an episode in a while. But, uh, yeah, it's it seems kind of like more about this town than any individual character in particular. But yeah, I I don't know. The key point about this is the release date, which is November 24th, which is like the week after uh, Let's Go Pikachu and Mm. Eevee release on the Switch. So this is... uh, And in the trailer, I feel like Eevee is featured fairly prominently, like, it's definitely not the only Pokemon that they focus on, but it, it you see Eevee quite a bit throughout the trailer. So it seems like this is uh, timed, you know, with specific intent. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's going to be crazy because that game is coming out, and then the week after that you'll have this movie, and everybody uh, who is into the Pokemon franchise are going to have uh, a pretty fun November. Yeah, it's going to be, I imagine it's going to reach a fever pitch when the game comes out. Who is this uh, girl with the crazy colored hair? Like the crazy like pink highlights. I didn't recognize her. And I haven't kept up with all the seasons of the show. I know there's a a season uh, currently running on Disney XD. Oh, really? Uh, that's like, it's based off of Pokemon Sun and Moon. But I don't know, I haven't seen it, so I don't know if this is a character from that or if this is just a new character for the sake of the movie. If I had to guess, I would say it's a Mm. new character for the movie. It seems like her main, if that's a thing in Pokemon, is uh, Eevee. And so she hooks up with Ash, who is Pikachu. So it it is like a good uh, mirror of either getting Let's Go Pikachu or Let's Go Eevee. Yeah, that's why I think it's timed so uh specifically there interesting uh, this is so something else that happened a little while ago but it's been a while since we recorded is uh this new valve game which i guess is like a is it a card game as far as i know it's yeah one of those dueling card games kind of akin a to yeah yeah like a hearthstone or there's a bunch of them now there's one for like the elder scrolls franchise yeah. that oh, i forget that the called? name of yeah i don't remember what that's called uh and there's one for um the witcher franchise which i also forget the name oh of. yeah that's gwent isn't it yeah gwent that's what it is and there's uh, magic the gathering just uh is starting up their online card game yeah so that that style of game is very popular right now and it's not going anywhere anytime soon but uh yeah this is a new one and it's the first valve game in five years which That's didn't crazy. they didn't they also recently buy a developer i think so i i don't remember which developer i feel like it had something to do with vr but uh yeah mm. they they used to be big time developers and now they just do steam and they're making bunches of money so yeah Uh, And so uh, mainly the reason why I think this is interesting is because it's a new Valve game. Artifact. They've recently bought a a developer, and you know maybe this is the start of 
like a new Valve where they're producing games again, which you know, That'd be great. maybe. Uh, you trying to think of Half Life Three? I am trying to think of Half Life Three. Maybe. <laughs> You know, every every time we record something, uh, at least a a word or two will fall just right out of my brain and I can't (laughs) think of it. So I got to keep the tradition alive. Anyway, yeah, Half-Life 3, it's happening probably sometime. (laughs) Take this as confirmation. This was, uh, you remember, uh, I think it was last year, that guy left Valve and he like put that thing on the internet that was basically a script for what would have happened in Half-Life 3. Remember when that happened? No. Yeah, he like he was the guy, I think he was the writer on Half-Life 2 or something. And he left Valve, he was like I'm retiring. And he put this thing on a forum or I don't know what it was. All the names were changed. Uh like names and genders were different, but it like it was very easy to read between the lines, and it was basically an outline for what Half-Life 3 would have been. I didn't read it, because I hope that it still gets made someday. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I also am just waiting. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, and eventually <laughs> Half-Life 3 will be confirmed. But I'm telling you, I feel like the framework is, is starting to get built there, where they can actually do it, if they're not already working on it. Well, something that is less shrouded in mystery as we move right along there was another nintendo direct did you watch this live i didn't get to watch it live uh i did not watch it live i only saw part of it so it was uh all about smash and it started out there was speculation like i think like sakurai tweeted something the day before or like gave some interview and he's like oh i'm really worried uh my eyes are gonna be bloodshot or something or something to that effect and people were like oh my god blood and for some reason that meant uh like castlevania and then something else happened with i think the soundtrack to castlevania and uh people were like oh man simon belmont is definitely going to be unveiled in this uh direct sure enough the first thing that happened uh was an insane intro that was luigi like dying. all like <laughs> yeah dying he, like it was like a luigi's mansion style thing but with real real ghosts and uh, like a grim reaper, like scythed through Luigi, and his soul got ripped out. And then uh, Simon Belmont showed up. But uh, isn't that crazy? It is like one of those weird things where, like, you know, video game characters die all the time. Like Mario is probably you've probably died as playing Mario like millions of times over, oh. and no one's been like, "Is Mario actually dead?" But now you get this cutscene with Luigi, and you're like, "Not Luigi! Don't take <laughs> Luigi!" Is he actually dead? And so, yeah, everybody right now is very worried that Luigi might actually be dead. Uh, I feel like he's not, but... No, he isn't, uh, but... He's been treated very poorly in this trailer. So then the meat of it was talking about uh, just more details. They're packing in, like, the Castlevania map has, like, an insane number of songs on it. It has, like, 34 songs you can pick from, and there's, like, over... I want to say like over 800 songs in the game. It's insane. They were talking about how they were just like willing to go crazy and just let them keep working on it. And they just like, I don't know, they didn't limit them. So they went uh, above and beyond. So that's a huge number of songs. The amount of customizability, like you can turn every stage into like you can get rid of all hazards if you want to. And like you can just like you can customize every part of this. Like they're really taking the... Uh, Smash Brothers Ultimate titles, like, seriously. Like, it is the ultimate version. It's, like, every character, I think every stage, like, all this, like, minute details you can affect. Uh, It's going to be very exciting. And it ended. Do you want to talk about how it ended? King K. Rule shows up, right? Yeah, I don't know who that is. Uh, I'm not super versed in the Donkey Kong franchise. He is, I, uh, I'm assuming, a the antagonist of the Donkey Kong franchise. Uh, he looks like... Um, I, I was pulling up a picture of him, and he does look basically like... A lot of like there are villains in the Donkey Kong uh, franchise. I remember I played the SNES game and you jump on these like alligator looking dudes. Yeah. And he's basically just like a chubby version of those (laughs) with like a crown on his head and a red cape on. Yeah. And he has Uh, like a gun, it seems like. Yeah. So (laughs) 
I don't know. It's interesting. I like that they're they're pulling sort of more obscure characters into the uh, Smash Brothers world. Yeah. Like uh, back when what was it? Uh, Smash Brothers Melee on the GameCube uh, came out, and everybody was like, "Who's Ness? We got to figure out who this Ness guy is." I still don't know who he is. He's from Earthbound, uh, which is a, a game that's on the SNES Classic. And oh, which I, you I've, own, right? I do own it. I started that game, but I haven't played very much because I got busy with other things and haven't been back to it yet. But I was enjoying it. It was a very interesting game. And I and people want another or a new uh, Earthbound game. But anyway, yeah, just like pulling random uh, Nintendo characters from over the years to add like to the, the Smash Fit Brothers trainer. lineup. I mean, those are a little bit more like, <laughs> like we didn't need that. But like, I thought it was I'm, funny. <laughs> It is funny, but like, wh- I I mean more like interesting characters from games that are not like uh, how we fit. That doesn't really count to me. <laughs> but, but who's uh, your? Uh, if you had to like pick a character that isn't in Smash yet, who would you want to pull? Oh in? gosh, I would have to think of the entire lineup of characters that are already in Smash. Yeah, yeah, they have a, a ton of them. Is Waluigi in Super Smash Brothers? No, he's an assist trophy. See, I would pick him because he's probably like he doesn't have his own game. True. Uh, and it was like a big thing when people realized that you could pick the Waluigi outfit in uh, Super Mario Odyssey because they're like that's the closest you're ever going to get to an actual Waluigi <laughs> game. <laughs> like, there's a Wario game, but you can't. There's, there's tons no, of them. There's no game dedicated to Waluigi, so it's true. Le, like uh, I don't know, but he I always play as him in like the Mario Party or, or Mario Tennis games or you know those types of games. So I don't know why he's not in Smash. Yeah, it's weird. It was a big letdown for the community. I think like that's not like an obscure character like I was just talking about, but like it would be cool if he was also in the game. What would your I, obscure character be? Hmm. I, uh, you're springing this on me and I have not thought it through. <laughs> Sorry. I have, I would have to come up with like a cool answer to that. And off the top of my head, I don't know. Well, why did you, did you think of something? I'm trying to think of it. I mean, the thing that automatically popped into my head, uh, that I wanted to be in smash brothers ultimate, uh, that is not obscure is, uh, the doom slayer from doom, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, but that's on switch now. I feel like Bethesda's got to oh, get I in guess on this. Like, I guess that's true. Yeah. Wouldn't that be insane if just like the Doom Marine was uh, like he could just like rip. I don't know. Like they couldn't do gore. So I don't know what his moves would be. But like, I mean, the BFG would definitely be his ultimate smash. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that would be. A, that's actually a good choice. That would be an interesting. Well, he would be a range character, which I feel like is not a it's not a, a super a thing right now, because most of his stuff would probably be just guns i mean he would obviously have to punch and stuff i guess he's got the the like uh, what did they call them in uh doom the glory kill he's got the glory kills so you can definitely like grab people and whatnot but i feel like a lot of his move set would just be like his crazy arsenal yeah which i i think we're gonna get to at some point in this podcast yes do, there's news to talk about with doom but like yeah that would be a really interesting choice i would actually like to see how he would fit in the smash uh universe but uh i don't know i was thinking more like classic characters like yeah. maybe like the excite bike dude like if, but like i don't know the doom slayer sounds way more interesting to me <laughs> now <laughs> i like the idea of uh like someone who's always on a bike. That's really interesting. Yeah. Like, to me. what if there was a guy that was always on a bike and he just, like was just like pulling tricks and that was how he attacked? That would be awesome, actually. And think about like what the stage would look like if he had his own like excite bike smash. Yeah, that stage. would be crazy. It would be maybe one of those like moving stages where you're like going along a track. Yeah, like the F Zero ones, mm-hmm. and uh, occasionally like these uh, dirt bike guys would like go across and like hit people. <laughs> Anyway, that's the best I can come up with off the top of my head, but let's move on to the next thing, because there are two sort of trailers that we need to talk about. Not necessarily, so trailers has a connotation, it could be anything. These are legitimate, like, long gameplay trailers. Doom more than what we're going to talk about next, but, like, 
there is like UI on the screen that's not necessarily cutscenes. We're seeing actual gameplay of Red Dead Redemption 2. It's like a seven minute trailer. And man, I was like, okay on this game. Like I was probably gonna get it. But after seeing this trailer, like this looks so good. <laughs> this looks really good. And we were texting a little bit after we watched this trailer and I reminded you that you famously hate the past. It's true. Not only do I hate the past, I hate, I don't hate, but I, I'm not super into prequels, especially where characters in the first game have perished. I, I'm like, I, it's not a spoiler to say that James Marston does not have a great time at yeah. the end of Red Dead Redemption. I was going to say, he, I don't hate the past, but I agree with you in, in terms of prequels. I also am not a fan of prequels. So, like, this game is going to be good, but, like, I think one of your main pals in it is Dutch, who is the bad guy in Red Dead Redemption. And, like, you're going to run into James Marston. He's going to be, like, kind of a like a hot-headed teen, it seems like. And you're going to be, like, forging a friendship and stuff. And, like, guess what? I know how they die. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's just it's kind of a bummer. Like, I like yeah. the I like the going out, like, especially in um, Westerns. You like the walking, the riding out into the sunset, you know? Like, oh, their adventures are going to continue. But for this, like, there's finite adventures, you know? I mean, maybe they I have mean, a couple years. It's, it's not even necessarily that you... Like, the reason why prequels suck in general is not even just that you love the idea of them riding off into the sunset and being able to uh, imagine their further adventures once the credits roll. Like, you want that tension of, uh, like, they might die, you know, in this... Uh, in the climax of the movie, like something might, something crazy might happen. Like one of them might die. You need that sort of tension to keep you on the edge of your seat. Because if you're not worried about the characters, if you don't care because you know that they're going to make it, like you kind of don't have that tension at any point uh, during the story. And so that's why a lot of prequels sort of fall flat is because you know where they need to be by the end of the the game or movie. Well, to that point, though, the main character of this game is never referenced in Red Dead Redemption, so we don't know what happens to him. Yeah, I guess that's true. I guess, you know, you could still have that for the main character, but as far as, like, seemingly two of the most important side characters anyway, I guess we, yeah. we don't know how much uh, John Marston's going to be in the game but yeah it's you, interesting you kind of don't worry about what might happen to him either so other than that though that's like my one sticking point that i'm not super into but i can overlook that because just like so many things that stood out to me in this trailer like the vistas are insane like this looks beautiful it makes me want a yeah. uh, ps4 pro like it looks gorgeous also like it makes me want it on pc not confirmed for PC. They are yeah. so bad about putting stuff they're, on PC. They're awful about PC. But the another thing I noticed was just like how detailed all the weapons were. Like when he's firing guns, like it's there are like close up shots of him reloading the gun, and it's like it's all. It almost reminded me of uh, that part during the Black Ops reveal where they were like, "We've modeled every single gun," and it's like super realistic. The weapons in this look v like very, very realistic, which I thought was very cool. But I think the thing yeah. that stood out to me the most was this new system of, um, I guess you would call it like the encounter system. I'm not really sure. But basically, in Red Dead Redemption, the first one, you would come upon these little tableaus as you were walking around. Like there would be a fight in a bar or like you would see on the side of the road, there was like a wagon that was like lost a wheel and some person was like, oh, help me. Or just like other random things would happen. And you could choose to engage with those people or you could just go past them. But that was really the extent to, of your decision making. Whereas in this one, it seems as though there are these context sensitive menus that come up when you are approaching a situation like, for instance, you're on, there's a scene in the trailer where you're on horseback and you ride up to this guy and he is doing something. He's like messing. I think he's robbing a carriage that is flipped over and you're bottom on the bottom right of the screen. It's like help, rob, aggravate, draw a gun. Or like you come upon a guy who is uh, like hanging on a cliffside. And he's like, help me, help me. And it's like, do you want to help him or kill him? And just all these like context sensitive things where you press a button and that's the game knows, the AI knows what you're trying to do. 
it's very interesting to me. It's like a level above uh, in GTA V when you just see random stuff happening. It gives you like agency. It lets the game know what you're trying to do, which I think yeah, is very cool. It's, it's like the NPCs have some sort of context awareness. Yes. And, and there isn't one of the scenes he like rides up and there's this guy doing something that seems not great. And you like the option comes up to either like intervene or like you can defuse the situation because the guy's like ready to draw his gun, like, you know, back away, like, don't get involved in what we're doing right now. And so he uh, the player in the trailer chooses to defuse the situation. So he's just kind of like, ah, whatever, it's not my problem. And he just kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, rides away like you kind of have the option to. Uh, interact with the this world that seems more like a living space where there's a lot of people doing their own thing. This is kind of like uh, we talk about it like the living city or whatever where we were talking about with uh, Cyberpunk 2077, mm-hmm. what we're looking forward to with that. Or like in Skyrim where uh, all the NPCs sort of have a route that they take every day and they mm-hmm. have... Like job, they'll go to their job and they'll be there for hours and then they'll walk home again at night and they they're all sort of active and doing things and then you can sort of go interact with them. But this is like taking that a step further by making it so that you can have more meaningful interactions with them and they might be doing uh, good or bad things and then you can either mess with them or help them or you know fight them. <laughs> Yeah, the melee combat, it seems like they have also increased the fun of that because old style uh, Rockstar games are not necessarily known for hand to hand combat. Yeah, (laughs) Uh, it's basically just like mashing square or whatever console you have. Uh, And I mean, it looks good. Definitely like in GTA five, you can throw some punches and they have some weight behind them and it's funny. But this looks like there's actual strategy and other stuff going on. I think another thing that I that stood out to me is it seems and i'm this is speculation but it seems as though like your horse like everything all your inventory is defined by how much you're carrying on your person and your horse like you can see every bit of gear you have so it's not going to be a thing where you're holding like 10 guns you can see the rifle you have around your like strapped to your saddlebag you can see your knife and your pistol there's a scene where he's like running and it's nighttime and he has a like a rifle in one hand and a a revolver in the other and he's like holding both of them which is really interesting uh that is really really cool to me like being able to see everything on your person and not necessarily having to go to like menus to look at all your <laughs> stuff yeah it's not like in a lot of rpgs where you're like holding a thousand items and you're like scrolling through this menu system to get to the right thing uh, you may, uh they made but- a point also of uh, your horse is like very important in this game. Yeah. I mean, did they explain more about that or why they, it's like, it, I think it's like in breath of the wild where like you have to tame your horse and sort of like get it to trust you. And there are better horses for better thing, like different things. And uh, if you don't have a good bond with your horse, he's hard to control when crazy stuff is going down. And it seems like uh, it is a lot more, I mean, in, Red Dead Redemption, I, I would just pick up any horse and try and go somewhere. But it seems like in this one, there's a big emphasis on your horse being your horse, which I think is very cool. Yeah, that is very cool. I wonder if some will be like better at carrying more items and some will be faster or, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Man, wouldn't it be great? And this is what I hope. Uh, if, if there is a, a mount that is like a donkey... That is not necessarily fast, but can hold a bunch of stuff. I feel like that's the mount I'm going to get because <laughs> I love donkeys. You love donkeys? I wonder if you can get like a literal donkey. That would be great. So something else uh, that I just remembered, they also put a big emphasis on the camp, which is, I guess, a moving. It progresses with the story, I think, but it's sort of like your home base. Like it's where you go to craft things and I think upgrade equipment, but it's basically you are on the run. I think, and you're you're part of like the gang, Dutch's gang or whatever, and you're on the run at the beginning of the game, and so you can't stay in towns. You have this like moving camp that is going throughout the map, and you go back there and you interact with your friends and you learn all about each person at the camp who's in your gang, 
And it's just like a place to come at the end of the night and kind of like, I guess, like spend points and whatnot. It's really interesting because I don't know what defines when the camp moves or if it moves every day or if like how long days are. Because if it if days are regularly like what they are in uh, Rockstar games, then there's going to be like a day every like 24 minutes or something like do you have to go back to camp every night? It's it's something I want more information on, but it's yeah. a change from the previous game. Yeah, I wonder about that too. I also wonder if, like you mentioned that you can talk to all the people and kind of get to know the people at your camp. I wonder if there's going to be something akin to like loyalty missions and like a Bioware game. There's definitely going to be a morality system because 100% it's going to affect gameplay if you are going around and like you always choose the option to murder everybody. And like you could be like very for uh, noble as well. So I could definitely see there being like morality and loyalty and all these like interesting systems that frankly, I have not played a game. I've not played a deep RPG in a while where you have to like worry about morality on an event by event basis. Yeah, so I, I feel I'm like in that. a lot of RPGs, even like Bethesda style RPGs have sort of moved away from that like morality system. But I kind of like it because it gives you sort of replay value where you're like, well, the first time I played through, I played the Paragon option where I was a good guy. This time I'm going to go with a Renegade option and I'm just going to be a real jerk to everyone (laughs) and I'm going to pick all the mean bad things to do. And you're then, right that it's gone out of style. I remember, like, so we both played Watchdog. Did you play Watchdogs too? I don't remember. No, I did not. Watchdogs two is like a spiritual successor to Hackers, and you're like a, uh, you're just like a a cool teen, and you have a bunch of cool teens you're hanging out with, and you're like trying to take down the man, and you're like hacktivists. There's no morality system in that game. You could kill everybody like you just have bombs on things and you can just blow people up to complete <laughs> missions and you can just go back to your secret base and everyone's like hey man look at this crazy spray paint i made yeah. <laughs> no one is ever like hey you just literally murdered an ent- like 30 people just driving around <laughs> having to not even solving things that is kind of like the rockstar you know gta style though right to True. Like you can just like run around in this open sandbox and cause havoc and get this big wanted level and be chased by a million cops and then either die or get away. And then like 10 minutes later, you're just doing the next cutscene and it's just like you're helping out some somebody with something. And it's just like there's not really a, any sort of meaningful consequence to what you do in that particular city. So I don't know. I kind of like the idea that when or I like when games do sort of a morality system. I agree. It does feel like there's some sort of weight to the choices you make. And it's also satisfying, like you're accruing points. Uh, Like whenever a game, Deus Ex comes to mind, uh, has a system for like having a ghost achievement where like if zero people see you, you get like extra points or if like you if you go completely pacifist you get extra points and it like also in mass effect like if i yeah. went hard paragon and didn't do any renegade stuff i would be like i would get rewards in the game for that like yeah, there's you get like tangible extra rewards. you get extra conversation options yeah yeah it, like I've played a lot of Bioware and Bethesda RPGs and yeah, those games are like when they did morality systems, they were very much like you needed to go either all in on Paragon or all in on Renegade because Mm -hmm. if you kind of stayed in the middle, you sort of didn't get anything for that. Yeah. And the thing about the the Bioware ones, like you mentioned Mass Effect, I kind of was playing Mass Effect again uh, fairly recently and I, it reminded me that because I was going to try to do Renegade and I almost always am like, I'm all right, this time I'm going to do Renegade <laughs> with this playthrough. And you, I always get to a point where it's just like, this is so mean. This is so evil. <laughs> like, I just I can't bring myself to do it. But you like you have to because uh, you want to build up those Renegade points because yeah. you get all the perks when you do it so gotta get those perks i wonder if they're gonna be skill trees i remember in red dead redemption one there was a, a system for upgrading your dead eye which was fun oh yeah and yeah. i i wonder how if there are going to be like perks in this which would be super fun 
Yeah, I wonder if they're making it a little bit more RPG like. I would love which, that. Which would be a new direction for a Rockstar game. And yeah, I would love that. Other thoughts before we move on? Uh, no, I am very excited. They did say they were going to have another trailer, right? With yeah. uh, more information uh, in the coming weeks. They, they have until late October, I think, is when the game comes out. Yeah, this to me sounded like a part one of a series of trailers where this was overview the next i think is like activities i want to say maybe this one's on activities but um yeah i think it's gonna be like a three or four part thing where each thing like there's probably gonna be one on like weapons and gear and like characters and things like that i wonder they'll probably do one on multiplayer as well and how all of that works so that'll be exciting yeah, because I remember there was that rumor that they were going to have a Battle Royale mode, uh, and I wonder yeah. if that's still the case. I wonder I wonder if they'll do it. That would be crazy if they did one. Zach, I brought up Watch Dogs 2, and I love the Watch Dogs games because I love hacking as a concept because I love the movie Hackers. But the one thing I didn't like about Watch Dogs was uh, there was not enough brutally murdering demons in it. And it seems like Red Dead Redemption 2 is not going to have a lot of brutally murdering of demons. (laughs) Well, I was going to say, I I liked the thing in Watch Dogs where you could invade other people's games. Oh, I read you. Yeah, that's a thing that you can do in another game coming up called Doom Eternal. Yes, we got a a very large chunk of gameplay, not necessarily story-wise, but... I think it was like 12 minutes or something or 17 minutes worth of uh, running and gunning, as they yeah, said. Yeah, and they... No, it was they, 26 minutes. It was very long, and they played a bunch of it, and then, like, the, this was, like, a, at QuakeCon, and so there was, like, two presenters came up, and they were like, all right, let's 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 see some of this game. And so they were showing off just, you know, running and gunning like crazy, and then it stopped, and they talked for a little bit more, and they're like, oh, here's more. And then they mm-hmm. showed, like, another cutscene, and this thing just kept going, and it was awesome. So let's break this down. First, they showed some concept of what the Doom Slayer looks like now. He's had an upgrade. He now has an insane telescoping sword on his left hand, and he also has like a predator gun barrel over his shoulder like predators have. Yeah. It seems like those are his two main upgrades. Uh, And once we got into the gameplay, he also has this like dash ability, which has two recharges as of like that part of the story, but I'm sure you can upgrade that where you just like vertically dash or not vertically you uh, dash in a straight line. And I guess the direction you're holding, it's, I'm not really yeah, sure how you of activate a, it. It kind of looked like a dodge. Yeah. You, so you can sort of dash forward, left, right, or back to sort of evade uh, incoming damage basically. Yeah. It just seemed like another interesting uh, addition to what is already a pretty uh, insane fast paced uh, move set. And another thing that they added onto this uh, crazy moveset, it it looked like you could interact with the environment. Like, at one point, he's jumping across and he grabs onto this pipe and, like, swings himself forward. Yeah. So uh, it seems like... Well, and the other thing that they had was there was an attachment for the shotgun that is this little, like, hookshot thing where you can, like, essentially spear an enemy... I don't know how far it goes. And then you'll pull yourself towards that enemy. And then, of course, if you follow that up with a shotgun shot, most likely you're going to kill the thing that you hit. But uh, the the gameplay showed him sort of chaining all of these different move, uh, like different movement things into some crazy uh, acrobatics. And I can't wait to see what other people do with it. I don't think I'm going to be... Uh, <laughs> able to pull off the craziest stunts, but I feel like people are going to have a lot of fun with that move set. It's so crazy when you chain because he has so he has the dash mechanic, and he also has the super shotgun has that crazy hook shot on it. So there are parts where he like is jumping like double jumping in the air, hook shotting, but not even like like letting go halfway through. So he just has the air momentum. Yeah. And then dodging forward, like, you can get insane mobility that way. And it's crazy. 
Like, the speedrunners are going to have a crazy time with this. I can't even imagine the crazy stuff. And so the other important thing they did, and I was reading an article, uh, one of the devs was saying, like, this made Doom 1, or, like, the Doom that came out in 2016, almost unplayable for him. They added, like, every demon is destroyable like as you're shooting them you're ripping flesh off of them yeah like they're completely destructible and the dev uh i was reading the article about said like if when you go back to doom after playing this it just seems like you're not affecting anything like yeah. oh my god i'm watching the trailer right now and just like <laughs> flying enemies are just add so much insane verticality like there are the the uh, keiko demon or kako demon i think it's keiko demon the keiko demon and uh just so many others are just like flying around and it used to be like you could maybe double jump up to them and like it was rockets was mainly the way you got rid of them now with the shotgun they are just like uh <laughs> they're just like a thing you can grab onto in the air like it's insane yeah. i'm not describing this well i'm i'm almost speechless watching this because it's just <laughs> it's so like the you talked about how there was a little bit of gameplay and then they came back and talked to you and then there was the second part of the gameplay the second part of the gameplay, they were just like, let's see how fast and crazy things can really get. And that's the part I'm watching right now. And it is just like, it is next level stuff. Like, there's so much air travel in this. He is barely touching the ground at points. Yeah, it is really crazy to watch this trailer. This is one of the best gameplay trailers I've seen in a long time. This game demos very, very well. Like, it's yeah. it's incredible to watch... Uh, and there's not a lot of like first person shooters that are doing interesting things like this. Uh, yeah. Not only with just like the insane number of weapons. Like at one point, I was just like, man, like you have so many different tools for destruction in this game. Like I wouldn't know what to pick almost. <laughs> and I, I would get to a point where I'm like, am I using the thing that is both the most efficient for taking out the enemies at hand, but also does this look cool enough? Could I be doing <laughs> something that could be looking a lot cooler? Uh, and yeah, so it also d still does that thing where if you hit an, an enemy just right, it will like they highlight them so that you can walk up and do one of those glory kills. And the glory kills with that uh, little sword thing that you were talking about that's attached to like his uh, wrist. It's like a wrist mounted sword type of a thing. The the glory kills that you get with that are just really cool. Insane. Yeah. Now, initially, when they were showing the concept art for the Doom Slayer and all this stuff, initially I was like, this is a little bit of... Uh, have, you ever, have you ever heard the term a hat on a hat? No. A hat on a... Like, it's basically like you're doing a little bit too much. Like, he looked so bulky with his insane, like, predator gun and also the sword. <laughs> I was kind of like, okay, this looks like a little bit like something I would draw when I was in grade school where I was just like, this guy should have like a thousand muscles and yeah. just like sword should be coming off of his hands. <laughs> and also just like, like it's the- too much. It's intimidating a little bit because like I, right now, I don't understand how the barrel on your uh, shoulder works because sometimes it fires a grenade and sometimes it appears to fire a flamethrower. And also there's got to be a button for dashing so what is that? Because it's not the jump well, button. So I'm assuming that the the like mounted weapon is just sort of a, an equipable item, just like any gun where you just like go into your inventory and like, well, right now I want this gun and it has like a secondary fire, just like any normal gun. I, I don't know what that would be tied to, but I would I would assume it's something like that. I don't know, man, because like, let's let's break this down. Well, there's got to be a crouch button, I assume, and there's a jump button. There is probably, I assume the glory kill button is the use button. There has to be a dash button. Well, so the glory kill is melee, which is yeah, usually yeah, thumbstick. Yeah. I don't know. I I was a little intimidated. But then as the more I watched, I was like, okay, this is the, uh, this is a necessary evolution of insane like gameplay. Uh, it's not a hat, on, like, maybe it is a little bit of a hat on a hat, just because, like, there's, they didn't take anything away, it's just, like, it's everything from the previous game, but also, there's all this other stuff, so it's just, like, jam-packed, it's like a two-in-one shampoo, you know, like, shampoo and conditioner, but it's one bottle, you know? Yeah. It is, it does look a little bit intimidating, just because it's so much, like I, I was saying, you're almost overwhelmed at the number of 
ways they give you to kill things. Yeah. But you you do almost need them just because of the the number of enemies that are coming at you. But also yeah. there are like like some enemies aren't going to take that much damage. Others will take a lot. So you can kind of I feel like you'll get into a rhythm where you're like, okay, I know I can take out this guy with uh, something smaller. Now I played the first uh, or the 2016 Doom on PC, and it's just like a scroll wheel. I feel like it's going to be a little bit more complicated on a controller, like you were saying, because you do have to like uh, you. I feel like you hold triangle to get to like a weapon wheel. I feel mm. like if you go back and watch this trailer, I think the first clip where he's like running around and you're doing a lot of glory kills and everything that looks like console gameplay to me because he's not whipping his, his uh, you know, his weapon around quite as quickly. And you do, I think you see him when he does swap to some weapons. Occasionally you'll see the, the weapon wheel pop up a little bit. Mm -hmm. The second video looks more like PC gameplay to me. Yeah. The fast paced part of it. Yeah, and because it is much faster paced, you can see he's able to uh, rotate his aim around much quicker, and you don't really see that weapon wheel. And that's true. To me, graphic wise, it doesn't really look different, <laughs> which is the no. Well, in- it is. It's it Tech Seven, which is I think an upgrade from Doom twenty sixteen. It's their latest engine, and this is also. I mean, it's not coming out for a while, so. There's gonna be more graphic, like graphic fidelity, uh, coming up. But yeah. like, I think this is an early test build. What was what we're seeing? Because I don't. Is there a release date? I don't remember. Uh, I didn't see one, but I don't recall whether there is or not. I'm gonna guess no. Speaking of release dates, this is getting a simultaneous Switch release. Really, I did not yes. hear that part. Same day as PC, everything else. That is insane. Isn't that crazy? That's really, really crazy to me. That's awesome. Uh, do you think you would get it on Switch? I don't know. I, I feel like so, the way to play these is mouse and keyboard. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So it, generally speaking, for a lot of games, if they come out on all consoles, including the Switch and PC, if it's like an indie game or like an arcade style game, more often than not, I'm going to say, oh, you want this on Switch. But mm-hmm. when it comes to like an old school PC shooter or pretty much any shooter in general, like PC is obviously the way to go. Yeah. I have not played a first person thing on switch yet. Uh, I've played Skyrim, but you can play that third person. I guess mostly I play it in first person, but I mean, that game is not uh, a shooter, so it's not really equivalent to something like this. Uh, you were going to get, uh, Wolfenstein 2 to play on Switch. Yeah, I just never got around to it. The other thing about Switch is, like, stuff does not go on sale on Switch for well, whatever reason. So right now, part of the announcement at QuakeCon is that all Bethesda games are on sale right now. Doom, I checked, and Doom is still $60. Really? I guess yeah. that's Nintendo. I it's have... $60 on Switch. It is $9 on Steam. That is crazy. I, I don't Isn't understand. That I don't understand why Nintendo does not participate in sales. Let's talk about this though. Uh, this is the first thing we talked about, and we kind of skirted around it. But the end of the gameplay trailer, or part of it at least, they were playing, and real people invaded this person's game, a la uh, Watch Dogs. So, what do you think of this? I don't know. I mean, the worry with uh multiplayer stuff is always like oh griefing is gonna happen but like if you're the enemy that's your job you know if anything it makes i mean it's gonna make it harder because you're playing against real people i think it's a i think it's a really good idea actually i'm into it so how does it apply to doom because i i I remember when the first watchdogs came out i watched a lot of people streaming that game and one of the streamers that I watched got really into just like the 1v1 where yeah. you were trying to like one guy was trying to hide and uh, sort of stealth the other guy and the other guy had to figure out where he was. And he got yeah, that was super so into fun. that and it seemed really cool to watch. I don't know if that's how that doesn't seem like a, an application to this game, though. The way it happened in the trailer was he was he was getting stuff done. The Doom Slayer was slaying, 
And all of a sudden, on like the middle of the screen, it was like invasion happening or like uh, people are invading. And then on the upper left part of the screen, it had two icons for two pe- like demons that were uh, that had like health bars. And so I don't think it's necessarily a game of cat and mouse where you're trying to find the people. They are dropped into your world and they're basically mini bosses. Like they are now the thing you need to focus on because they are actively trying to kill you and like working together. So it almost becomes like the Doom multiplayer from Doom 2016 where like uh, when you were in multiplayer, you would get like a demon rune and become a demon Basically, they're dropped in as super powerful demons, and probably the more you play, the more you unlock, like, the different demons you unlock to be, yeah. like, eventually you can be, like, a mancubus and stuff like that, but you probably start out with just, like, an imp, but, uh, I mean, it's, like, Left for Dead, kind of, like, when you die, you become, or, like, it's, you know, hunters versus zombies a little bit, but they're, like, special zombies, so, I don't know, I think this is a super cool idea. It's interesting, although... I assume it's also going to have like a normal PvP mode or the normal PvP modes that like yes. the old Doom had. They have also said so they aren't talking a lot about multiplayer right now, but they have said it's going to be different from what Doom 2016 was, which Doom 2016 I think was just regular deathmatch and then like some weird variants of it that no one got really into. No one really played the multiplayer of Doom 2016, but I think they're trying to change that with like this especially this is something that i would love to do like if we both loaded into whatever kind of lobby system this is and we're like we want to be partners and we want to drop into someone's game and just like mess with them can you that sounds super fun can you have more than one person drop in it's not like a 1v1 sort of thing in the trailer two people drop in at the same time interesting i don't remember seeing this trailer so or that part of it anyway it was in the part where they started doing mouse and keyboard stuff. It was right at the end. Two people drop in, and then it like cuts to black. Once you see, like, oh, these monsters have usernames. These are real people. Then it cuts to black. <laughs> so I, Bethesda is clearly going in, like, a, we need to add some multiplayer elements to our games because Fallout 76 is obviously mm-hmm. an online game now. And uh, Doom Eternal, which we were speculating because of the fact that it's you know eternal or whatever this would be like an uh, like a service a game as service that would be ongoing and it would have some sort of online element that they were going to try to support kind of makes it a little bit games like this gives it such crazy replay value especially if you're unlocking as the game or like multiplayer progresses different demons that you can drop in as well yeah so that's my question uh is this all happening within the space of like just a regular uh, mission from the campaign or is this like some sort of I don't know like a strike mission or something like what What would no. this be I think this is a feature you turn on where at different points in the level there are there is the ability for people to drop in and if you have this feature on then it's going to start matchmaking without it's going to be like watchdogs where like in watchdogs you were just running around and all of a sudden it would be like you've been hacked well yeah like, but that's like an open world game where you could just be messing around or you could be in a quest you know this uh, like uh doom is far more linear than that well what do you think about this i mean this is something i was going to ask you is it linear this time i don't know i guess they didn't show or specifically say one way or another Definitely the part in the trailer where he is on that space station and everyone was like, oh, my God, it's a Doom Doom Slayer. Oh, my God. Yeah. And like uh, he is like uh, messing stuff up and there's that big BFG or whatever. That's linear. But I got a real sense of did you ever play Darksiders? Yeah. I got a real sense of like Darksiders when he was down on Earth, just like a big open area where you don't necessarily know where you're going. Like it's just a huge swath of land you know maybe that was just because they're similarly they're similar art styles but uh i don't know man what if this is a more open doom i wonder about that that would be interesting if like because it is on earth i guess what if it Mm -hmm. was sort of like an open world space and then when you accepted uh, a quest or something either you went to like a different area Mm -hmm. or you know, the the mission parameters sort of loaded in or, or for that particular area or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. That could be interesting. 
But I feel like they would have been upfront about that. They would have said, okay, this is an open world game, which they did not. A criticism of Doom 2016 was that all of the DLC was multiplayer based. I think a lot of it was free, but like all the content updates basically were, oh, you can do more with Snap Map, or oh, there's another new multiplayer, or oh, there's new demons in multiplayer. They have confirmed that there are DLC plans for this Doom Eternal, and they are single player focused, Mm. which people are excited about. Yeah, I guess I didn't really think about it, but the, now that you're mentioning it, it, it it is really weird that they never did do any sort of single player add-on DLC missions for 2016 Doom. But yeah, I guess it's cool to have more of the the main game. The main game does look really cool. I don't know that I would play with like the invade feature on, mm-hmm. but I would maybe try it out, but I don't think I would play with it on very much. Something else they talked about is uh, they're very into lore in the world. That was something I really liked about Doom 2016 is as you looked at the like logs or whatever, you figured out what the Doom Marine was. And it wasn't just like, it's not like Doom 3 where it's just like generic Marine guy is trapped in all this stuff. Like there's deep, rich lore about like, like the mysterious origins of the Doom Slayer and things like that. And it seems like you're going to go to some crazy places. They were showing concept art and actual like maps from, I assume, later on in the game where, I mean, I guess it's like crazy upper levels of hell. There was some, oh, that was the other thing that I thought was a hat on a hat. The, the One of the first uh, concept images they showed was like, look at this new demon. And it was like, it was like a torso of a demon and the bottom part was like a hover tank. Oh. It had like a chainsaw <laughs> for a hand and also a rocket launcher for a hand and like rockets on its face. And I was just like, this, there's too much going yeah. on with this. I, I like, remember that too. I was like, this, this is, it's a bit much, but I mean, I guess it's kind of cool looking if you. The Hell Knights and like the Barons and just like, it's all simpl- it's like very simplistic and clean in Doom 2016. And like, this is basically a ball demon that shoots fire at you or like this is a flaming skull or like this is an imp but this is just like i don't even know what to call that thing like is it a hover tank or is it some sort of centaur like (laughs) i don't know yeah it is you can definitely tell when you're looking at one of the sort of updated versions of the classic uh demons that you're killing versus one that the the new devs who are like, all right, we're working on this crazy Doom franchise. Let's design something that's really crazy for 2018. You can tell all, you can tell the difference between those. It's all addition. Like, there's no. And it's, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It's just it took me a little bit to get used to. It's not like like if an enemy in the first game was a centaur, and the second game maybe someone would be like, oh, what about if like the bottom half is like a cat or something? That would be interesting. Instead, it's like, okay, it's still a centaur, but also it's got circular saw blades on both its hands and its mouth opens up and it's got a giant chain gun coming out of it. And that's just default what it looks like. <laughs> it's just adding, it's, it's, it's all addition, which isn't bad. It's just like, man, it's like a lot of stuff. Well, like it's just adding. The other thing is like the other stuff is mostly like normal demons and maybe they have like some sort of crazy gun and this is more like how it's sort of like demon cyborg which you're like Mm -hmm. well how did that happen like where (laughs) where in hell is that happening like who's building these cyborg demons that was an interesting thing because one of the other demons they showed i don't remember what it was called but it had its armor was similar to the Doom Slayer's armor, and they're yeah, like, "Oh, yeah. there's a story behind that." Which makes you wonder, like, maybe that's part of the story, and maybe we're just being too critical of it right now. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it is a thing that will be explained within the story and the lore, uh, you know, as it goes on. Maybe there is somebody who's like taking these creatures that you've essentially dismembered and destroyed in the last <laughs> game, and they're like fixing them up and sending them back out there after you. It would be Um, interesting. I mean, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt because Doom 2016 is such a good game. Yeah. Like the the level design of the the, Doom 2016 and the environments are so like intricate and so crazy. And uh, just on that engine, everything looks so great that and especially considering the the types of movement options that they give you, like just being able to play around in that space. It was uh, 
so well designed. This is not like, it's not procedural generation. This is literally designed by hand by someone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It just like the, the level design that you see in these trailers look incredible. And granted, you're going to be flying through it at a million yeah. miles an hour. So you're not going to necessarily stop to, to look at it. But I, I when I had a, a slow second in Doom 2016, I would sometimes just stop and look at stuff because I was like, this is crazy what they <laughs> did with this place. I put the next segment to be let's talk about Destiny again. But being as you're the only one that has played Solstice of Heroes and we're planning on playing more of it together, maybe we skip that and talk about it next week? Uh, yeah, that works. I, I will say, maybe I should, like, what I told you a little bit uh, this afternoon, and then we can get into the real meat of it uh, maybe next week after we've had okay. a chance to play some more of it. Yeah. Uh, I was, like, 90% sure that I was not going to get uh, the new uh, Destiny 2 DLC and now Mike, our often mentioned friend, uh, has gotten me back into playing this game. And there's enough like new stuff to, to sort of seek out in what they've added. And there's enough like sort of quality of life fixes. And there's enough of a grind there that was so absent before that... Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling destiny again. I'm enjoying it. The way, you know, it kind of comes and goes for us where yeah. we won't play it for a long time and then we'll get addicted to it for a few weeks and then we don't play it and then they drop something else new. And they always have that thing that will like hook you back into it. And um, I don't know. I think the Solstice of Heroes event that they have going on that we'll get into later uh, has me really strongly considering buying the DLC so. That's very exciting to hear. I was, uh, I think I was also a little bit on the fence. I was more pro- positive of Destiny. Like I, I'm pro all the Forsaken trailers that I'm seeing, and I like the new darker tone. But uh, yeah, knowing that you're probably going to get it as well is making me very excited. So we'll get into it a little more next week when we have both played a little bit of it and sort of ground out some of those rewards. But something you're not positive on, and something I'm very surprised by as well, equally surprised is you uh, pre-ordered Black Ops at, to, to get the beta, and you are not into it, Zach. Now, granted, I have only played a handful of matches of the Black Ops 4 beta, and it's just the, the multiplayer stuff. The, the um, what is it, the Battle Royale mode is uh, still yet to come, but there's... Blackout. Sh- yeah, Blackout. There should be a, a beta for that at some point in the near future, but... I don't know. Like, it reminded me of why I, I haven't played a Call of Duty in a long time. Uh, I don't. I did play, I guess, Black Ops Three when it was free in what was it June? Mm-hmm. It was like the free game of the month on PS4, and I kind of enjoyed that and have had some fun with it. But uh, I don't know. I maybe it's just because the maps were a little bit too claustrophobic, and the. Um, the the starter weapon that they give you that you have to use until you can unlock the ability to create a class i was really not enjoying that weapon mm-hmm. and i don't know the player abilities they they felt kind of ripped from other games and not necessarily call of duty to me yeah like your grenade or if you're the character that you're playing even has a grenade is on a, a cooldown. It's like an ability, basically. It's not a grenade anymore. And you have to remember to heal up instead of auto-healing, which I don't mind so much, but it's just like a weird random change for the sake of change. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it just... I don't know. I didn't like the the maps that much. They felt very small. Maybe it's just because the last uh, PvP game, other than uh, Destiny very recently that I've played any uh, amount of would be Battlefield. And I have I consider myself more a Battlefield guy at this point. Like, I played um, Modern Warfare, the first one, when that came out. I played a ton of that game. I played uh, each Call of Duty every year after that until the first Black Ops game. That was the last one that I played. And I just kind of got burnt out on the series. And after that, I kind of 
moved over to the Battlefield franchise, and I liked not only that the maps were more open, they were much bigger, they seemed a little bit more thoughtfully designed to me, Uh, and then you also have vehicles, and the classes matter a little bit more. They're not just sort of, you know, free reign to pick anything you want. There's like some sort of team teamwork sort of within those classes that you can do. Um, Call of Duty just feels like you spawn, you run in, you either kill someone or you die, and then you spawn, you run in, you kill someone or you <laughs> die or not. Like there's not really a lot to it. And this game sort of reinforced that in a very short amount of time to me, and I was not enjoying it for some reason maybe i should give it another chance but the beta has ended so well so you you were talking about canceling your pre-order but do you think you'll keep it until the blackout beta happens uh i guess i probably should just to see what that's all about but you're not super into battle royales but this could be like the battle royale you know well and the, the other thing to consider is that we still don't know if Red Dead Redemption's doing one. Yeah, we that's a good point. still haven't heard much about what uh, the Battlefield developers are planning for their uh, sort of Royale mode that they claim is incoming. Oh yeah. So I forgot I, that they said those words. Yeah, they did say those words, and uh, I so I wonder if it's going to be enough to make me want to play it because. I wonder if they can make maps large enough to make that an interesting game mode. You know what I mean? Because Call of Duty is very much about small maps and very fast-paced gameplay. And it's almost too much. I like that in games like Battlefield, there's time to like sort of strategize a little bit. Or, like, Mm -hmm. pick a route. And in Call of Duty, there's no time to stop. You just... Yeah, it does seem very... I was watching people play on Twitch, and it's just, like, go, 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 and you're constantly just dying. And you never know where you're dying from, it seems like. It's just you just fall over. That's the thing that really started getting on my nerves as I was playing this beta. I was just, like... For one, I don't know the maps that well, so maybe that's part of it. But, like... I I was constantly just like, oh, the objective's here. And then I would just die. And I'd be like, well, I had no idea where this person was. And (laughs) I was like, am I getting too old to actually play Call of Duty? Is that the problem? I'm like Mm. old and out of touch. I don't I don't get it. But I don't know. It just like to an extent that will happen in any shooter. But it just feels like 10 times worse with Call of Duty just because of the frantic pace that everything runs at. And uh, another weird issue is that because they've sort of extended the health bar a little bit, so everybody has a little bit more health, you can't, like, quickly pick off multiple people because they will just team shot you. Like, this is the Destiny problem from, like, Vanilla Destiny 2 where, like, health, I think they changed the health a little bit and the number of players and, like, they took away how quickly your abilities regenerate basically and so people didn't have the power to deal with more than one person at a time yeah and i was feeling that pretty hardcore in this uh black ops beta where if i saw more than one person i was like well i'm done like there's nothing i can do about this situation (laughs) i don't have the tools to deal with this so i don't know in a in a battle royale though no one's ever gonna have teams so you're never gonna get team shot it is true. I, I'm very curious to see how they adapt Battle Royale to the Call of Duty franchise. And that might end up being like the uh, their new premier game mode that uh, makes it worth owning Black Ops 4 mm-hmm. to be able to play. But it remains to be seen. And if I was getting the game, it would not be for the multiplayer that I played in this beta, basically. I'll just say <laughs> that. So... Well, we're running a little long, but do we want to talk about uh, what we're playing slash watching? I think it's all watching. You can tell me about Animals. I have not watched this show. Oh, so this is a show I discovered. Oh, man. So I've been watching it from the beginning. I, for some reason, had HBO like three years ago. I think I was borrowing my parents' HBO. 
And it is an animated series, and it has a bunch of people. Basically, if you listen to any comedy podcasts, like someone from each podcast is going to show up. Like uh, Scott Ackerman is on an episode, Lauren Lapkus is on an episode. Just like a bunch of really cool people are on episodes, and it's basically each episode is called a certain animal. So there's like uh, rats, or like dogs, or uh, horses, or like things like that. Um, And it just follows these animals around New York City, but each time the animals are played, or usually the animals are played by these the two same guys, the creators, who are uh, Phil Matteris and Mike Luciano, and they are just like friends in real life. And so usually the two animals that are the main characters in each story are like basically the same people. And also like as the seasons go on it's like lines start getting blurred and they start referencing other segments. And uh, it has a really cool kind of relaxed style that I like a whole lot. But season one was really great. Season two was also really great and included an episode with live action people. Like there was an an episode called like people, which was very crazy. Uh, And there was this, there's always like a, a meta narrative going on. It's like in the first one, it was all about this like murder that happened. You would see like these, tableaus off to the side where in between segments there would be just like wrongdoings going on in the mayor's office and then season two was all about this like crazy like pharmaceutical company that was doing bad stuff and the people episode was like all the people in that uh like bad company but at the end of the second season a bomb goes off that kills all humans in new i'm not spoiling anything (laughs) uh that kills all humans in New York. And so season three that just started, there's been two episodes I think so far that I've watched is all about just like New York has become animal town. So like there's, there's characters from previous seasons, like the rats are kind of the main characters and they're just going around this. Like it adds a whole new, like there's no more like side tableaus of like humans doing things and you can't understand what they're saying because they're humans. Uh, It's all animals and the narratives are just really good. And they're breaking down all these walls where just like, uh like the first episode was about the rats and the second episode was about dogs and even though it was like different people or like different animals it was still voiced by the two guys and they were like referencing stuff that happened in the last episode uh and it, it's very self-referential and very funny and uh i really really like it it's on hbo and season three is airing it's very bingeable i i really enjoy it i might have to check that out i've been looking for shows to to start binging recently so the two main characters are just so likable and they sometimes have uh like an adversarial relationship but in general they're just like very kind to each other which i like a whole lot and uh i don't know it's just uh (laughs) it's a very funny show and like uh it has it makes really good references it's a little bit like rick and morty in that like uh it's very uh wittily written and there's very there's a lot of like real world stuff they're commenting on and just like i don't know I guess it's bad to say things is like Rick and Morty are like Rick and Morty, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean that in the best way where like both shows are written very intelligently. Mm. Now, we have also both seen Mission Impossible Fallout and we don't probably don't want to dig into that on this episode. We should do a whole uh, Starside flicks on that because I have a lot to say about that. OK, yeah, we might be a little bit late on it, but yeah, we should definitely do an entire episode for that. And then I had like a bunch of notes about stuff I wanted to talk about, uh, about Pokemon Go because this summer has been like the summer of Pokemon Go for me. I've just (laughs) like, as an excuse to get out and exercise and sort of gamify, uh, my exercise and encourage me to just sort of get out and be active. I have Mm -hmm. started playing Pokemon Go again and... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of new stuff in the game since last time that we played. So, but we don't have to necessarily get into all of that this week. Maybe we'll do a video on it. It would be cool because you, you have that screen recorder. So, I, oh, that's you have true. a Mewtwo. That's true. I do. So, uh, like raids are a thing in Destiny, or not Destiny, gosh. 
uh, in Pokemon <laughs> Go now. Uh, and they, I guess they have been for a while. We're late to all of that because I hadn't played in over a year probably. Yeah. But uh, there's this new EX raid that is like an invite only. I guess it stands for like exclusive raid or whatever. Ooh. You have to get uh, an invite to it, which you get from just sort of battling or raiding at gems that are eligible for EX raids. And yeah, I had my first one uh, last Friday and mm. I, I went out and I was like, I, I got there a little bit early because I wasn't sure if people were going to show up to this thing or not. And uh i finished the what is it the special research thing so i got a mew uh as a reward for the special research and then shortly after that i did the raid and i got a uh a mew too so i'm like slowly sort of filling in my pokedex <laughs> uh but yeah it was crazy how many people came out to this thing like there were so many people that we had to split into like a group or three different groups at least. Were you talking to these people or this was all just happening organically? Organically. Well, this, it would happen more organically because of the EX raids, because they're invite only. Now, if mm-hmm. it's like a normal raid, you're probably going to have to, like, you can go out and you will get lucky and people will be out and about and you'll just happen to have other people to raid with. Like, you and I, when we went out to lunch one day, uh, we ended up raiding at this place and we were we were fighting Machamp and just some other random guy was also raiding with us. And so that made yeah, it, that was great. That made it much easier. You will have situations like that. But with like the EX raids, you know, other people are going to show up because they've been specifically invited to that gym at that specific time mm-hmm. and that specific place. Um but yeah, there was uh, three different groups. We split into groups based on our team distinction because uh, which I so like we're team mystic, which is a blue team. And whoever uh, does the most damage to the raid boss gets extra pokeballs to try to catch the raid boss at the very end. So you you want to be in a larger group of your team. So every, when we decided that we had so many people out for this that we needed to divide into groups of three or a, a group of three. No, three groups. I can't. Words are hard right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, we split up by by teams so that we would each get extra chances to try to catch Mewtwo at the end. Uh, didn't need it. Caught him in like the first or second uh, ball that I threw. So nice. That works. But uh, yeah, it's it's fun. And so many since so many people were out and there were other raids nearby, we just like most of the people sort of hung out and did the other two raids that were in the area because they were there and everybody was grouped up together. So might as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, it's been fun. I am really enjoying the way they sort of reworked the gems and the whole raid system and just the, the number of like new uh, Pokemon to catch, like obviously gen two and gen three are out now. Yeah. uh, Which they were not last time we played. So I'm, there's a ton of stuff. I'm like always catching new things that I didn't have before. Yeah. When I open it, I open, I only open it up like two or three times a week. I'm it's happening more, but uh, every time I open up, I feel like there's a new Pokemon that I've never seen before. Yeah. So uh, it's been fun uh, sort of catching a ton of new stuff and like learning the best sort of gym battlers and gym defenders and like what to use against raid bosses. And and I've been surprised at how many people are still actively playing the game after all this time and uh, just how active Niantic has been in not only updating the game, but like adding new features. So there's always yeah. like new stuff. There's always events going on. Uh, like the the raid bosses will sort of rotate in and out every month. And every couple of weeks, there's an event like this uh, last weekend was Community Day. So on both Saturday and Sunday for like three hours each day, there was um, like a crazy number of Eevees spawning. So, mm-hmm. oh yeah, and Eevee is great because there's so many different possible evolutions for that Pokemon. So, it's super useful. Uh, at the start of the day on Saturday, I had like probably over a hundred candies for Eevee, and by the end <laughs> of Community Day on 
Sunday, I had like over 1400. Oh my God. Yeah. So I, I can do a lot of evolutions now and we're, <laughs> we're waiting because, uh, um, gen four is like imminent. I think people are speculating that it will come very, very soon. And there's going to be two new EV evolutions. They call them evolutions. Aha! Aha! So, uh, yeah, that could come anytime. And, of course, there's the integration with Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Yes. For November. And then there's the new movie. So there's a lot of exciting stuff. Oh, and PvP might be coming later this year. Yeah, that would be insane. So, and uh, Jurassic World Alive has proved that PvP can work. And from what I've... I think when Pokemon Go was announced, like, that's what everyone wanted. They were like, oh, yeah, po- or catching is great, but, like, this is going to be, like, real Pokemon, right? Like, we're going to be able to fight our friends, right? And then there was just silence from yeah. uh, Niantic. So this is going to be... I mean, I think a lot of people came back when they added the friends list. Like, that definitely brought me back a little bit. And I think even more people are going to come back when it's like, guess what? You can fight people now. Yeah, so friends list and trading are a thing now yeah. in Pokemon Go. And I feel like that's sort of them laying the groundwork for PvP stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they might have to change the way battles work or come up with a different system for PvP. But uh, like I said, Jurassic World Alive has PvP and it works not too differently from the way the like old Game Boy game Pokemon games worked. So, I mean, they can do it. There's options. I don't know if, you know, the Pokemon company is like, you need to make this different than the Game Boy games, which I think <laughs> is a thing that they were told at one point. So maybe they yeah. they wanted to be fast paced. So maybe, I don't know, turn based is not necessarily an option for them, but I'll be interested to see uh, how it works out. But I don't know. It's been like the summer here is way too hot to spend a significant time outside, yeah. but uh, I've had fun getting out, going to parks, walking around, and or even just like walking around the downtown area. There's always uh, a lot of interesting stuff to catch and uh, sights to see. So I don't know. I'm like all in. <laughs> I actually, you know what, Zach? I took a walk today for the first time in a long time. Yeah, you told me that, and you know, instead of thinking good for you that's good you got exercise way to go i thought you could have been playing pokemon go that whole time i could have and when i when we started playing destiny earlier today i was like oh man i could have been playing pokemon and i will do that tomorrow i'm gonna try to go for i mean i have nothing going on this week so i'm going to different places around my new town and just trying to find good like trails so i think i definitely am gonna play some pokemon tomorrow in a new interesting location you know what you should do there is the uh, the Silk Roads website has this nest atlas where people can go contribute. They'll like uh, go to like their local parks on the map, and if they've been there and they've seen like nests where a lot of uh, a particular type of Pokemon are spawning, they will mark that as a nest. And so then, if you look in your area, you can see what types of things you can get, so you know where to go specifically to get the best stuff or if there's one that you're like i don't have that pokemon i want to go there and catch one or if you're like i want a lot of candies for that one so i can evolve my pokemon then i'm going to go there i've done some of that uh this summer as well uh so it's a useful resource um so yeah look up the sylph road definitely all right, well, it was an extra long ep, but we skipped a week or two, so I think that was warranted. Uh, and there's going to be more regular stuff, so look forward to an ep next week, and we're going to have some videos coming out this week probably as well. So we're back at it. Hoping to get back to it in a big way. I think that's it for this week, so uh, thank you for joining us. We'll catch you later. Goodbye.